The Beautiful Brain is a series that shows you key steps of brain development using art. If you search this word, art, on a dictionary, you will find at least two different meanings. Art is the use of imagination to express an emotion, especially in painting, drawing or sculpture. That's maybe the most obvious one. But if you scroll down, you will find a second one that says that art is also an ability or a skill that you can develop with training. I want you to focus on this second way of thinking of art, because the masterpiece for this last episode has nothing to do with a painting or a sculpture. The masterpiece of today is a skill. It's the ability of a man who came to this place and devoted his life to the land. Rafael is my cousin, is a grapevine pruner, and his vineyard is like a big family of vines. A vine is a plant that has the natural tendency to grow more and more, to spread on the ground, to climb over other plants. Rafael takes control of this uncontrolled growing and gives a shape to the plant. But vine pruning is not the simple trimming of branches to make the plant more beautiful. Vine pruning is a delicate moment when the trees are prepared to produce the best bunch of grapes. It's spring and grape vines are starting producing the first leaves and fruits, all coming from an average of 30 bats per plant. One could think that having more bats means getting more grapes. Well, that's correct, but it's not always the case where the more the better. In fact, each bud demands energy, and if this energy has to be split between many of them, the grapes will stay small. That's why Rafaele selects between six and eight promising bots and prunes the others. He keeps a selective minority, and that minority will get the most of the energy, growing bigger and better. In the end, pruning means making a choice. Should they keep it or should they trim it? That's a very important question because the choices taken today will affect the way the plant will grow, the fruits it will produce and the harvest in autumn. Keeping or trimming? Here comes Raffaele's ability, or even better, here comes his art. He knows how to read the plant and how to make the right choice. Believe it or not, what I just told you is not only a typical day in my cousin's life, it's actually a description of one of the last steps of brain development. We just have to watch it from a slightly different point of view. A brain is like a big family of neurons, and while the brain is developing, they grow, they ramify, and they start to talk to each other, creating connections called synapses. If you remember from the last episode, synapses are the points of communication between neurons. Now, I want you to imagine them to be like the buds on a grapevine. When it's spring for the brain, when the brain is developing, synapses are overproduced. By the time we are two years old, a neuron can have up to 10,000 synapses. Now, if you consider that the brain has around 100 billions of neurons, a baby brain can have up to 1,000 trillions of synapses. Basically, the number one followed by 15 zeros. Okay, that's definitely not comparable to the number of buds on a grapevine. But starting from two years old, nature treats the synapses the same way Raffaele treats the buds in spring. Nature selects half of them and prunes the others. And this process is called synaptic pruning. Much like pruning the grapevines, the removal of some synapses reallocates the energy to the remaining ones, giving to these connections the opportunity to grow stronger. Again, pruning means making a choice. Should I keep it or should I trim it? Do I remove a connection between two cells, a piece of that network that is inside our head, or do I leave it there? Nature makes a choice following a very simple rule that we can summarize in a single sentence. Use it or lose it. Synapses are electrical connections. The ones that are used the most are kept, but the ones that are not used that much are removed. Wait, wait, wait. Let's stop for a second. This pruning process seems to make no sense. Wouldn't it be easier to start already with the right amount of synapses? Well, the answer is no. In fact, synaptic pruning starts when we are 2-3 years old, and most of it happens when we are teenagers. And this is a critical moment in our life, because we are growing up, we are learning, we are experiencing the world around us, and we also started making our own opinion about it. And our brain is prepared to face this intense moment in life, armed with trillions of extra connections. From an extreme point of view, it's a bit like if the brain would be pre-wired to meet every life possibility. 
And while we are growing, we are learning, we are living, the wires that I use the least are disconnected. Raffaele prunes the buds on a grapevine, but who prunes synapses on a neuron? Well, it's not a simple question, there is not a single player, but I would like to mention at least one that kept me quite busy in the last five years. But to do so, we have to go back at the beginning, and not at the beginning of this video, but at the beginning of our journey together. This is my PhD thesis. I've been working on a project about synaptic pruning. And here there's a picture that shows you two neurons that are connected through a synapse and a green cell that is touching it. This green cell is called microglia. Microglia are one of the brain pruners. They have a lot of processes that are used to survey the surrounding. And when they found a synapse that, as we said, is not super used, microglia remove it. And this was our last chapter. We left together for a journey that covered five key steps of brain development. And now, at the end of this amazing journey, we came back to the starting point to remind us that everything we know about the brain comes from these papers and these books. These are the result of the work of many passionate researchers that spend their lives spying inside the head of Mother Nature. Scientists that try every day to reconstruct that fascinating project that is triggered at the beginning of everyone's life. We transform these papers into a story that narrates the development of the brain as a work of art. It's not a conventional way of talking about science, but it is very inspiring. And that's why we call this story The Beautiful Brain.